Shorewood Bible Church South. Let's all stand. We're going to sing our doxology. Let's all stand. I know you just sat down, but that's all right. Enjoying this beautiful weather. Yes. We just don't know what we get next week, right? <laughs> Supposed to be hot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the leaves are turning though. I saw some. I saw some leaves turning. So we're we're late in the season. So we're thankful to the Lord for all things as He, um, especially for His power. We're gonna sing three thirty, so you can get that. But first, we're gonna do our doxology. a good reminder of what we already know and we're always we always need to remind ourselves of um, the, the way that our mindset is as we live in Christ Christ is all that he claims to be I'm so glad that he lives in me my hope of glory yes he is for he is mine and i am his amen now let's turn to 330 power in the blood by request by request from brother george <laughs> all right verse one let's start would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Verse 2. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Verse 3. Would you be free to what's wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Verse 4, would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. 
Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. <laughs> Let's remain standing for the scripture reading. <laughs> Good morning, Saints. Good morning. 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 Our responsive reading is the book of Revelation, Exodus, the last chapter, chapter 22, verses 11 to the end of the book. The book of Revelation, verses 20, chapter 22, verse 11 to the end of the book. Uh -huh. The book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 11 to the end of the book. Appreciate the song about the power of the blood. Amen. I remember uh, first being saved and I kept talking about this blood, this blood, blood, blood thing. It's almost like there was a vampire type of thing. I don't know what to do. What to do. <laughs> but as I have matured and grown, I understand the blood is about yeah. the death. There the death of Christ. All right? His death is where that power comes from. Yes. Okay. That's, yeah, that's it. Okay, okay that's, that's important. So okay. the blood, shedding his blood. Man, death. Death is what gives life. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, in the book, uh, again, good morning to those out in Meadowland, too. You know, also, thank you for joining us. Revelation, book of Revelation, chapter 22, uh, starting at verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Let us be and the commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bride and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to every man who every the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the place of written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He which testified these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 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 Let's have a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, again, we, we thank you for you just being you, the God and the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The one the true living God of the universe. We thank you. We thank you for the cross work of Christ. The shed blood on the cross. Which is death, burial, and resurrection. By believing that fact, that simple fact that Christ died for our sin, was buried and rose again, results in our being identified or spiritually baptized into the body of Christ. We thank you for that. We thank you for your complete account of the scripture. We thank you for the apostle Paul, the administrator of the dispensation of grace, brother. The reason Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to us through and through our apostle Paul and the Christian Lord and the Spirit of We thank you for your spirit, 
enables us to understand your word rightly divided and we can correctly ascertain your will for today. We're here today to honor and to worship you in spirit and in song. We're trusting that each and everything that is said here today, done here today, thought here today, will be all to your praise, honor, and glory. And we look forward to that in Christ's name. Continuing with our um, theme of power in the blood, I look right next to uh, 330, to 329, which is saved by the blood. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Save, save, my sins are all pardoned, my gift is all gone. Save, save, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. As we sing this song, my expectation is that the ladies will say, save. <laughs> and hold that, and the men will say, glory, I'm saved. Okay? Okay, verse 2. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, the angels rejoicing because it is done. A child of the Father joined heir with the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Now, ladies. Saved, saved. My sins are pardoned. My guilt is all gone. Saved, saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Verse 3. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. The Father he spake and his will it was done. Great price of my pardon, his own precious son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved, saved. My sins are pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Saved, saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Let's go to verse 4. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved, saved. My sins are pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Save, save. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Amen. Good morning, Saints. Good morning. Make sure I got the right one this week. Yes. August 25th. Welcome to Soul Bible Church South. 
what the King James Bible says, what it means, it means what it says. It is our prayer that the light of God's word will shine in your heart through the singing, preaching, teaching, and exhortation of the word and of his grace. Wednesday night Bible study starting at 7 p.m. in person service. The teacher there is Pastor Arthur Johnson teaching on the book of Hebrews. Saturday morning Bible studies. The time is 11 a.m. The address is 1142 East 67th Street in Chicago. The teacher there is Brother George Crump. You want to phone ahead. If you plan on being there, phone ahead. That number is 773 851 6430. Saturday, September the 7th, 79th Street Renaissance Festival. That's the annual Renaissance Festival on 79th Street each year, each summer. 79th and Racine. The time is 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. We'll have one booth, so we're encouraging everybody to come on out, be a part of the ministry and sharing the gospel. Today, Sunday, August the 25th, is our monthly business meeting. That's each uh, final Sunday or the last Sunday of each month. Today is just such a Sunday. We're encouraging any and everybody to feel free to join us and participate in that if you're members, especially if you're registered members. Uh, but all are welcome to attend. It's the last Sunday of each month. September birthdays, Sister Sandra Nixon. Happy birthday to Sister Sandra Nixon, November the 20th. Sister Willie Mae Davis, um, September the 30th. Is that correct? Okay. Sick and shut in. Sister Sarah Ruffin, Sister Margaret Ruffin, Sister Donna Griffin, Sister Sylvia Burke, Sister Jan Harris, Sister Mary Wright. Also on our uh, broadcast, TV broadcast channels, Can TV, channel 36, AT&T, that's channel 99, channel RCN, and channel WOW. August broadcast, Monday, August the 26th at 9 a.m., teaching on the book of Romans, what Paul's apostles, apostleship excuse me, signifies. Then on Monday, August the 26th at 8.30 p.m., the final authority, concluding on Tuesday, August the 27th at 10.30 a.m., the final authority. Are there any other announcements outside of the bulletin that we're not aware of, that I'm not aware of? Oh, um, just wanted to uh, make mention, uh, acknowledge uh, the loss of a, a loved one uh, from the Owens family, Sister Rochelle's aunt, uh, I've been made aware of this morning, passed away. And so we just want to acknowledge that and um, keep the family lifted up in our hearts and prayers and in our thoughts. Um, we pray for the whole family. Uh, we pray that God's grace will be sufficient for you in this particular time. Um, if there are no other announcements, Brother Kenny, if you please. Praise the Lord, thanks. We come to the glorious, one of the glorious times of our ministry. When you get to participate in what God is doing. I always like to say, if you search the scripture and find out what God is doing, and become a part of what he's doing, you'll be in the perfect will of God. As always, I like to give a Short teaching on why we give. Today I want to come from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2. And it says, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. So, why command them to give? If any man teach any otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus the Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, therefore, we believe both laboring and suffering reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, 
especially of those that believe. Therefore, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gave us richly all things to enjoy. Enjoy what? That they do good. Amen. That they be rich in good works. Ready to describe, distribute stuff willingly to communicate the gospel. Laying up for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for the benefits that you have bestowed upon us that we may use them wisely in a time such as this. Because our will is your will and that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for having a chance to give and had a desire to give. May God bless you, keep you in good health all the days of your life. Let's stand for our um, song before the sermon. Um, we're going to go to number 500, when the roll is called up yonder, number 500. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Verse 2. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor, let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and the work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Amen. Amen.
there is one piece of um, I don't want to call it one piece of information, but one thing left to do. Missing happy birthday to my daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, right <laughs> birthday was yesterday. Oh, gosh. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Amber. Happy birthday to you. Get all wired up here. All righty. Take your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And we're going to continue with the message um, that I, I began last several weeks. Preached last week. We'll continue this. That same message out of Romans 1, verse 16 through, through 18. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. Paul writes here, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let us bow our hearts in the word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace, our hearts of thanksgiving, thanking you for great love wherewith you loved us. And that you spared not your own son, but delivered him up for us all. And we thank you. We thank you for the privilege and the blessing of being able to come together today. Gather together around your word. To study your word. We pray for listening ears and believing hearts. And we pray when all is said and done, that it be to the glory and to the honor of your name. And to our edification. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we are, again, studying the book of Romans. It may not appear that way sometimes, but uh, there are subjects or topics in the course of going through. It's not so much a verse-by-verse -verse study as such, <clears throat> but to highlight themes around which the book itself speaks to. Now, last week I said to you that uh, when you come to the book of Romans, it introduces you to uh, new and different things. Um, and the best way to appreciate that is reading the Gospels and the book of Acts. And if you have that, and when I say the book of Acts up until the salvation of Saul of Tarsus. But everything beginning in the book of Acts, I mean, in the book of, uh, of Matthew, a, a, a great verse to summarize the Gospels is Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were unto John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. That was the 
the message. That was the focus. That's what it was all about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in the early parts of the book of Acts. You remember in Acts 1, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that focus, that emphasis wasn't departed from, but, but was continued. Acts 1, 6, Peter asked the question, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That's what the ministry and the message was all about. Um, I have to watch some of the things I get off on because it takes away from me getting further along in my message, but these are things that are designed to help you appreciate uh, what Paul is saying, or what I'm saying at this point, and getting to what Paul is saying, but when I speak about the gospel of the kingdom, that that was to focus, the law and the prophets were unto John since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. Uh, look back at Daniel, Real quick, Daniel chapter 2. And that reminds me. Go ahead and get, get Daniel 2. <clears throat> but I, I think it's important that you understand the nature and the character of the ministry today. And not allow the ministry to be defined by the doctrines and the commandments of men. Now, you got those places. I want you to take a look. Say again. Daniel 2. Uh, we're going to look down at verse 44, but I'm not going there immediately. <laughs> but we're going there. Um, but it's important for me to say what I'm about to say. I was watching a little bit of uh, uh, WJYS, the... Um, Christian radio, uh, Christian television broadcast, and happened to listen to one of these Word of Faith teachers. And I listened to him for a, 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 a little spell. It's hard for me to sit and watch these guys anymore. So. <laughs> oh, but you know, I hadn't done it in a while, so I just wanted to kind of make sure things hadn't changed. They hadn't changed. Uh, yeah. And what am I talking about? Look at Second Timothy chapter 3 for a moment. I have so much Right now, just thinking about what I'm thinking about will take up all my, my message time. Uh, these are things that are impromptu. Uh, I don't, I didn't plan or think about doing this at the moment. I was, but it's, it is something I think is important. I'll try to get through it quickly, though. Ephesians four. Uh, you don't have to turn there. Just, just, just listen to, to me now. <laughs> like I say, the verses just start. You know, your, your mind just start running the verses. But in Ephesians four, um, Paul talks in verse fourteen. He talks about that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine 
by the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. I sometimes, it's kind of hard to say certain things because on the one hand it seems like you're not being accurate or you're not being truthful. But this verse talks about uh, an activity that I don't think the church is really conscious of. But if you listen to them from time to time, you think they are conscious of it. But what they're doing, they are, you know, there's a verse over in Timothy talks about, um, yes, um, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Amen. And I asked a question because, I, I, of, you know, of, of the audience. I, I like asking the question, where are those evil men and seducers? And generally, when you're in a particular assembly, when you're in a church, even like our own, when you ask that question, you rarely, or if ever, think of yourself. That where you're, where you're sitting and listening, that that verse is talking about you, about where you're getting your information from. When you, when you hear the Bible speaks about evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse, you're generally thinking about the other church or the other denomination or the other ministry or the other pastor, but certainly not the guy that's standing there reading those very words. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And the reason that you don't think that because you don't, you, you, you view your, you, you view your church you view your denomination as the measure, as the standard. And as long as what is being communicated is in line with our church, with the church that I belong to, um, then evil men and seducers is the other guy, is the other ministry. It's certainly not us. But let me say to you, that the measure of truth, the measure of faith, and I'm just going to read these things because I'll, I'll never get through it if I ask you to go looking for them. Just keep the verses I've given you. And just remember, just in case I ask you to remind me where I was. But in Romans 16, 17, Paul says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions, and offenses contrary to what? To the doctrine which ye have what? Learn and avoid them. Now again, if you're sitting in a particular church, when you read those verses, you're not thinking of the church you're sitting in. Not thinking of the ministry that is citing that verse. Why? Because in your mind, and in that ministry, by the way, that ministry is thinking that they are the measure, that they are the standard by which you judge these things. So if someone is teaching contrary to what our church is teaching, then they're the ones that are causing divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine that that church ministry has taught you. But you would be wrong if you thought that way. Look at verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. I was talking with my uncle yesterday. And 
one of the great difficulties, one of the things that is hard for him to grasp is how when you're sharing the word of God and you're, showing, you're pointing things out to people that refute what they believe, things that, you know, that they cling to and embrace as true, but you show them from the word of God that that's in error, that's wrong. And, and for us, what that's all about is, is just basically that people are failing to rightly divide the word of truth. And what that simply means, you're failing to acknowledge who is being spoken to. And at what time, okay? Uh, all the Bible is for you, but it's not all to you. All the Bible is for you, but it's not all about you. And so you have to rightly divide the word of truth. I, I gave the illustration how we from time to time get somebody else's mail in our mailbox. And if you're not paying attention to the, just because it's in your mailbox, you may have a tendency to not know who the letter is addressed to. And you proceed in opening the letter. And you open that letter and you find in there, in that letter, some promises. And you love what is being promised. You, you, you want to embrace those promises. But then someone points out to you that your name is not on that letter. Let's just say it's your neighbor's letter. It's your, it's, or maybe it's a reward. And the reward in that letter is not to you, but to your neighbor. And you got all excited about it, ready to run with it, only to discover it's not your mail. Now, you can be like denominationalism, Christendom at large, I don't care whose name is on it. <laughs> right. We call that uh, a larcenary. Right. You know, spiritual theft. Taking right. somebody else's, you know, in this case, taking somebody else's blessing. But people who do that, Brother George is making this point, Every, every week. They don't care what the Bible says. They don't care what God says. It's what they want to believe. I, I've talked to you know, other ministers about things in the Bible and, clearly, and, and get them to acknowledge, no, that's not what the Bible teach, but it's what our church does. It's what we do. So forget about what God says. It's what we do. And so you pointing that out is meaningless to us. Why? Because we're doing what we want to do. We don't care what God says. Well, now, that's the gist of, uh, first, of Second Timothy chapter 3. I, I think I had you go there, right? That's the gist of Second Timothy, not chapter 3, but chapter 4. Beginning at verse 1, Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Now notice what he says. Do what? Preach the word. And I know the average person you talk to think the word of God is being preached today. You turn on the television, you're listening to the radio, or you've got all this literature being printed up, and you think the word of God is being preached. But if you have to be exhorted to do that, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and what? And doctrine. He says, for the time will come when they will not do what? endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned on the fable stories. Contemporary preaching today 
principally revolves around the individual. You hear that expressed by such words as God has a wonderful plan for your life. And they embark upon that course of speaking to you after that manner. God has a wonderful plan for your life. You know, what's your vision? What's your dreams? You know, what's your challenges? What's your trials? What's your tribulations? And so they speak. They, they focus on those kinds of things. And I'm sitting there listening. And I, you know, been listen, I've heard these things like ever since I've gotten saved. And it hadn't changed. And you think it would have. For people who are supposed to be in the book, reading and studying. And when you come away from that kind of preaching and teaching, you still don't know anything about the doctrine of the Lord. You have no idea, you have no clue about what God is doing. And all you're doing, you're looking at the world and the things that are going on in the world and, 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 and have this expectation of, of being exhorted, being comforted, by those things that speak to your particular experience. And that, you know, comf you know that edifies you, that builds you up, per se. And I say it that way, I'm talking, because I, I'm talking about people who are focused on themselves rather than truly the doctrine of the Lord. And they're looking for that in when he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, they're not looking at the doctrine that they're supposed to be building in the right. mentality of their soul, that edifice of sound doctrine, that they build in, in their soul, which is the doctrine of the Lord. It's about God's will. You heard Brother Kenny say it uh, in, 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 in the preaching and the teaching out of here, generally put the emphasis upon when you talk about being in the will of God, Find out what God's doing. Go do that. And you'll be doing the will of God. Now, that's not what you hear being preached and taught out there. It's actually what you, you generally hear is having God come into your life, inviting God into your life. And it's not about you inviting God into your life invalidating your vision and your desires, your wishes, your dreams, but God inviting you into his will and his purpose, into his work. You become a part of what God's doing. God wants you to be a part of what he's doing. But that's not the message that you get from Christendom. Now, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Is that one of the verses I gave you? I didn't give you that verse? Okay. <laughs> what other verse did I give you besides uh, 2 Timothy? Daniel 2. Okay, hold on to Daniel 2. We're coming. <laughs> Philippians 1.27. Now, the message, what we're focused on here. Let me go back. Yeah, let me go ahead and do Daniel 2. Because I'll be getting into my message if I go to Philippians 1.27. I had that on my mind because that's part of the message. I'm not there yet. So go back to Daniel 2.44. And just conclude the thought of what I was speaking to here. 
you, your interest in the Word of God should be about God and what He's doing. When you develop an interest, you may come in to the, to the church with one motivation, but in coming into the church, it is the desire, the hope, that you learn what the real issue, what really matters about church. And that's being informed with regards to the things of God, what God's doing. And when you come into the church, your focus generally is on you. It's about me. I got a problem. And I need somebody to help me work this problem out. But it's on you. It's about you. It has nothing to do with what God, you, you, you could care less about what God, God's concern is. It's about, I, I'm the one that's having a problem. I'm the one that's looking for answers. And, you know, and you may have heard enough to drive you to the church. Uh, you ask the average person, you know, why they go to church. Or you hear people talk about the need to go to church, but what need? Why are you going to church? A lot of people think that just by going to church, whatever problems they are having and experiencing, that by going to church, all of that's going to be smoothed out, worked out. And, it's, and, 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 just, and I'm really talking about just by just simply going to church. <laughs> now, hopefully you'll learn the right reason for being in church. Because if the, the problems that you have that drove you into the church, if the, they go away, you know, without a it being God revealing to you what your real problem is, you know, but, you know, if you come to church because you're having a financial problem, what happens soon as those financial problems are, are resolved? And you tend to think that God had stepped in and made matters right for you. And so you, 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 you just become that much more religious. Okay, you, you, you become that more clinging to the doctrines and the commandments of men rather than the doctrine of the Lord. Because that's, you're not there because of the doctrine of the Lord. You're there because you found some information that you think addressed the problem you were having. Again, financial or whatever. And so if you, if, if you thought you had a financial problem, you thought God responded to that problem by you going to church, then all of a sudden you, 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 you think you know God, and you think that that's knowing God, you think that's how God works. And you begin to peddle that kind of information. You become a witness to that kind of information. Okay? Which none of it is true. That's, that's not the truth. Anyway, Daniel 2.44, that's that's what I'm speaking to. That's what I'm trying to get, get you to understand. What we're doing here is different from what denominationalism does. Our focus and our emphasis is different from what denominationalism focus is. Ours is truly and generally upon the written word of God and doing just what Paul told Timothy to do. Preach the word. You don't preach about it. You don't preach from it. You preach the word. So that means you open it up and you teach what's being taught. The doctrine of the Lord is not, you know, developing a motivational uh, structure of information. You know, you can do that from the Word of God, um, but just simply exhorting people and comforting people isn't the same as preaching or, or it is not the same as sound doctrine. Let me say it that way. 
Again, what did Paul say? They were no longer endure what? Sound doctrine. They, they, they shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears, preaching and teaching the things they want to hear, right, right. as opposed to what does God want me to hear? What is it that God wants me to know? And let that be your, you know, your guiding light. Daniel 2. Now, in, in Daniel 2, the reason I bring you here in conjunction with the, uh, the, 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 the words I was saying to you in the beginning about Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were unto John, since that time the kingdom of God is preached, is to say to you that when you come to the Gospels, it is about fulfilling the law, the prophets, and the sons. It wasn't just simply to exhort people, except simply to comfort people. Now that's what the shepherds of God, that's what the priests of God was to do with regards to the with regards to the nation of Israel. They were to do that, but it was how they were to do it. It wasn't just with any words, but it was with an understanding of what God was doing, understanding their problem, why they were in the conditions they were, and how they could fix it, how that situation could be fixed. But it's looking at the matters as they are presented in the Word of God. In Daniel 2, you see the course of, of history laid out there for you. The course of history beginning with Gentiles ruling and reigning over the earth, a situation where Israel, the nation of Israel, was to be the people to do that. God raised up Israel. They were to be the kingdom of priests. They were to be a holy nation unto God. They were to be how, how the government of this earth was to be administered by that nation. They fell. God gave the government governmental authority of the earth unto the Gentile. We call that the times of the Gentile, where they are ruling and reigning and governing the earth. And in the course of that, God lays out a, a path, a course, by which he's going to reclaim the governmental authority of the earth back unto himself, under the reign of the nation of Israel, under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's what prophecy is about. That's God's plan and purpose according to prophecy. When you read the prophets, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's what the gospel of the kingdom is all about. Okay? Okay. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, early parts of the book of Acts, and just say it just, just cut off abruptly there, what's the next book after the book of Acts? Romans. The book of Romans. Okay. That's the next book after the book of Acts. When you read Romans, I challenge you. To see if it presents itself as a continuum of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the early parts of the book of Acts. Okay? Is it about the gospel of the kingdom? And to any unprogrammed individual who've been programmed to think that way, that it is. You see that chart behind me there? That chart behind me is a an outline of your Bible 
from Genesis to Revelation, excluding Romans to Philemon, excluding Paul, his ministry, and his message. That chart represents what the Bible calls, or what we, 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 we have ascribed the, the, the term prophetic program, but God's program of prophecy. That's prophecy. There's a program in your Bible called prophecy. It's a plan and a purpose that God is working out from the beginning of the world. Daniel 2, God gives a vision to Nebuchadnezzar. God gives Daniel the interpretation of that vision. And the vision that Daniel has is all the way down to the end of time. Okay? To, to the second coming of Christ, setting up of his kingdom. You, you hear people talk about it as the end of days and all that kind of stuff. But it's the last days. Daniel 2, 44, sees all of that. If you look at verse 44, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven do what? Set up a kingdom. Which shall never be destroyed. You know why it's called the kingdom of heaven? Not because it's a kingdom that is going to be in heaven but rather a kingdom that originates in heaven, but to be brought to the earth and established upon the earth at the second coming of Christ. We shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, get, get Mark chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is about the fulfillment of those things. The law and the prophets were until John. The prophets, they prophesied of things to come. The law, it was a shadow of things to come. Beginning with John the Baptist, it's at hand. The time of God's visitation is here. The time where God is going to fulfill the, the, the shadows with the real thing and the prophecies that is talking about the things to come to bring them, to, to bring about the reality of them in time. Mark chapter 1, verse um, 14. Now after that, John was put in prison. Again, the law and the prophets were until who? Until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is what? It's not just basically being said to come now. It's being, it is said to be at hand. It's within your grasp. It's Within arm's reach, you can have it. It's yours to possess. Mark 1.15 says, The time is what? Fulfilled. The time that God had appointed to favor or to bless or to bring about the salvation 
of the nation of Israel. To restore the kingdom to that nation. Now, those are the days and the bringing to pass, the bringing to reality, all that the law, the prophets, and the Psalms had indicated. That time was now, beginning with the ministry of John. That is the beginning of the last days of prophecy. There. And what are they preaching? The kingdom of God is a repent ye and believe the gospel. But that's what they're doing. That's the message. That's the essence of the gospel of the king. You want to know why you have the, the emphasis upon repent and believe the gospel today in the in, 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 in majority of your preaching? And by the way, when when you see repent and believe the gospel in the gospels. Um, he that believeth and is what? Baptized. baptized shall be, that's why water baptism is such is an integral part of the gospel of the kingdom. Um, that was the message of salvation to the nation of Israel. Now, I, without getting into all of that, just knowing that when you hear that, repent and be baptized, that's not God talking to you. That's not God talking to any sinner in the dispensation of grace. That's God talking to Israel at a time where God was visiting that nation. Okay? Now, um, in, so... When you come to Roman, that is not the message, as I'm saying. In Roman, there's something new and different. If you look at Romans 3.21, real quick, we, we, we saw this last week. Let's start at verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are what? that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, who was under the law? Israel. God condemns that nation, and by condemning that nation, he condemns all men. Because what had God d done before he called Israel out and separated them out? He gave them up. He gave them up. Right. Right. When Israel joined the Gentiles in their rebellion against God, he concluded them in unbelief along with the Gentile. To what end? That he might have mercy upon all. And that's all men without distinction. For there is what? No difference. So in verse 19 again, now we know that what things soever the law said, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, and get this, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh, there shall no flesh be what? Justified in his sight. For by the law, it's the knowledge of sin. But now, something new and different from what was being presented in the Gospels. In the Gospels, if you had asked the question, as the one rich young ruler did of the Lord, my good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what was Jesus' reply? Keep the commandments. What does this verse say? Verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law. That wouldn't be your answer today. 
If someone asks you, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You don't say keep the commandments. Not only that, you don't say repent and be water baptized. Because those are messages to who? To Israel, principally. But now the righteousness of God without the law, <clears throat> because see, the law in time past, the basis of God's dealings with man was on, on, the, on the basis of that law. The principle of God's dealings with man was on the basis of the law. Okay? You wanted God to accept you? You kept the law. You want to be on God's bad side? Don't keep the law. That's how God worked in time past. That's what Romans 3 21 is saying. That's the past. That's not now. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, that's what the law and the prophets bore witness to. But it also, in time past, that was the basis of God's dealings with men. If you wanted to be accepted of God, what did Peter say uh, to Cornelius? Uh, about he that worketh righteousness. Uh, Acts 10.35, but in every nation that God, first he proceeds that by saying God is no respecter of person. But in every nation, he that feareth God and what? Worketh righteousness is accepted. With him, accepted with God. That was the basis of being accepted with God. But what does he say in Romans 3? But now the righteousness of God with, without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by what? Faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that what? That believe. Not work but believe. Not do, but believe. Now go to Philippians 1.27. Our text is about the gospel of Christ. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In Philippians 1.27, speaking about the gospel of Christ, only let your conversation be as it becometh what? The gospel of Christ. When I say something new and different is being presented to you in Romans to Philemon, that's exactly the point. You have a new standard. You have a new guide. You have a new instructor. Real quick, keep your place in Philippians. Go over to Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that what? Bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. When you talk about the gospel of Christ, you're talking about the grace of God. Paul in Acts 20 talks about to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Okay? Um, let me look at that verse because I seem like I'm missing something. He talks about that I might 
finish my course, God set him on a path, set him on a course. We begin with that revelation of Jesus Christ to Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. That I might finish my course, how? With joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. From the very beginning, what was Paul's ministry? To testify the gospel of the grace of God. Not to testify the gospel of the kingdom. From the very beginning, Paul had one calling, one course to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Go back to uh, Titus 2. For the grace of God that what? Bringeth salvation. Now, again, this is not the same salvation was being announced by the ministry of John the Baptist. By the way, what was that? Look, look at Luke chapter 1 real quick. I'm, I'm, I'm working to closing. I won't get all this in, but I'm working to come to be able to close this out with a complete thought. But look at Luke chapter 1. In verse 68. Luke chapter 1 beginning at verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of who? Israel. For he hath what? Visited and redeemed his people. You remember at the birth, the, the angel announcing the birth of Christ? Thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his who which people? His people from from whose sin? Their sins. Now, if you don't if you don't pay attention to the words, if you don't pay attention to who is speaking and to whom is being spoken to, you just might read into that verse yourself, thinking that everything that God says from that point forward applies to you. And it doesn't. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since when the world began, to what end? That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Can I tell you that God is not talking about your enemy? He's not talking about the hands of people you're, you know that are against you. And so you read verses back there in the Old Testament says, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper, thinking that that's God talking to you, and it's not. And you live in this city long enough to think that no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. You, you just live, walk these streets a little while and see how protected you are, how much of a hedge you have built around about you. How many guardian angels? Would, you, you listen to some of these people' testimony. All of a sudden, the, the guardian angels must have been off, you know, off slacking off their job, you know, taking a break. And I'm talking about for Christian folks. Yeah. But notice that verse seventy-two to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father, Abraham. And in that verse, that's according to the flesh. Abraham, our father, according to the flesh. God made some promise to Israel. Um, like I said, I, 
one verse leads to another, and I'll be I'll be here all day. Um, but anyway, you you see where I'm going with that. Um, go back to uh, Titus. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now watch verse twelve, teaching us. Teaching us. Um, I know what I want. Get Romans 11 real quick. I'm going to be finished by 12.30 for sure. Got to stop because we got a business meeting. <laughs> Romans 11. And, and I'm focused on this salvation. I want you to understand something about this the power of God on this. When Paul uses that phrase, the power of God on the salvation, it's, there's something about this issue of salvation you need to be real clear about. In Romans 11, 11 and 12, I say then, Romans 11, 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, what? Salvation. Through Israel's what? Fall. Fall. Salvation has come unto who? Now, what does it mean for Israel to have fallen? That the kingdom that was to be restored to them has been put on hold. They do not realize the kingdom promises. Okay? Okay. And why don't they realize them? Because of unbelief. <laughs> why did they fall? Because of unbelief. Okay? And as a result of their fall, which means that salvation hasn't come to, to the nation of Israel. That's my point. As a result of their fall, the verse goes on to say, salvation is what? Come unto the Gentiles. But what salvation? Not the salvation that God sent to the nation of Israel. Made up on their end. Right, but my, my point is, beginning with the ministry of John the Baptist, God sent salvation to who? He shall save his people from their sins. God sent salvation to the nation of Israel. When they, because of their unbelief, that salvation message that was sent to them was what? Withdrawn. It was cut off or interrupted. Let me say it that way. It was cut off. And so when it says, as a result of that, salvation has come unto the Gentile, it would be a mistake to think that the same salvation message and program that was sent to Israel is now being sent to the Gentile. Because that's where you get the doctrine of the replacement Israel. Okay, that's what that would grow. If 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 you think that God is through with Israel, then salvation coming to the Gentiles means that God is going to fulfill His pr promises through the Gentiles. That is not the case. You can't read these passages of Scripture and think that what God is doing today is a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and so forth, were the promises that God made to the nation of Israel. In fact, Israel would call, would bring a, 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 a lawsuit against God. And they did in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Declaring God was unrighteous. And because he didn't keep his promise, we're going to sue him. You read Romans 9, 10, 11. That's what they're... That's the case. They're trying to make a case against God. You didn't keep your promise. Therefore, we have a right, you know, uh, to charge you with unrighteousness. But now let me show you how that is not the case. The salvation beginning in verse 11 is new and different from the salvation that was being preached before. Jump down to verse 26. Let's start with verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of what? This mystery, the casting away of the nation of Israel, and the sending of salvation to the Gentile. 
Lest ye should be what? Wise in your own conceits, thinking you're somebody, you're not. Thinking you have replaced Israel, and you haven't. God hadn't replaced Israel with you. Okay? Um, uh, lest you should be wise and known. That blindness in part has happened to who? Until when? The fullness of the Gentile. So God is definitely doing something new and different. Beginning with Paul. Beginning with the book of Romans to Philemon. And you know that because in verse 26, when God is done with what he's doing today, he's going to return back to what? To bring him about the salvation of the nation of Israel. And so in verse 26, he says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now I'm going to have to stop there. I hope you get the gist so far. In my point earlier, this is preaching the word. This is what preaching and teaching is supposed to be about today. Not the kind of stuff you hear generally emphasized and talked about. Because of all the kinds of preaching that you hear out there that you've been subjected to the majority of your life before you came to know the word rightly divided, how many of you knew these things? How many of you knew these things in the course of them, how, what God, was, God is doing, and how he's doing, why he's doing it? You didn't. You know why you didn't? Because the people who were preaching it didn't know. If you ask the question, how come I never heard that your preacher never preached it? Why didn't he ever preach it? Because he didn't know. Second Timothy 2 2 says, And the things that thou hast heard of me, Paul, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to what? Teach others also. If you're teaching and preaching what Paul preached and taught, then you would know these things. And the way you know uh, preachers and teachers aren't teaching these things, they don't know these things because they're not teaching these things. And, 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 and the worst is to know these things and not preach them. Okay? That's the worst. All right. Uh, Got to stop, and um, we have our business meeting this morning. All welcome to stay. It's going to be short. Uh, do plan uh, probably to be done by one o'clock. I don't think we have a lot to get into, um, but this is our regular monthly business meeting. You go ahead and put that. I'm